Great. Okay. So there'll be some people coming in as we as we get going. Um, but yeah, get, we're, we're going to we'll make a start then. So um, just as an introduction, really, um, thanks for everyone for joining us. And um, for those of you I don't know, uh, my name is Katie. I'm one of the senior lecturers at the university. And um, this lecture is brought to you by the professional practice team across interiors and architecture and also with the support of PASS and um, it'll be recorded um, for the past YouTube channel as well. So you can return to it at a later date. So as an introduction, um, Power Out of Restriction, Poor Collective, um, was co-founded by Sean Adams, Larry Botchway, Matt Harvey, and Ben Spry. Um, Sean, Larry, and Matt are all alumni of the University of Portsmouth. And it's our pleasure to welcome them back. After graduating from Portsmouth, Sean and Larry went on to study at the Royal College of Art where they met Ben. And the four of them co-founded Poor Collective in 2019 with a 10 point manifesto, which seeks to challenge people and society by focusing on the importance of raising the profile of marginalized young voices within our community. I hope that's a fair uh, translation. <laughs> in their own words, Power Out of Restrictions is a show social enterprise that focuses on the development of communities through the elevation of young people. Poor sees the power of the younger generation and seeks to get young voices heard. Through knowledge, sharing and design, we aim to bridge the gap between communities, bring together a wealth of demographics and empower the youth of today. And so um, with the support of PASS, please join me in welcoming Paul Collective. I'm going to be sharing the presentation. Yeah, could um, Ben get some sharing powers, please? Oh, there we go. No, I've, I've, I had them all along. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Everyone see that? Maybe give it a little thumbs up if... Uh, yeah, that's uh, great. Ah, uh, great. Off we go. Okay, so afternoon, everybody. Um, hope everybody's in good spirits. I know I certainly am. And we've now got a, a, a roadmap into the getting out of lockdown. So, yeah, so we are um, for Collective and we will be hosting today's presentation. Um, today's presentation will consist of a brief introduction into who we are, how we came to be, we will talk about some of the um, projects that we're currently working on. Um, this will then feed in nicely to um, some of the lessons that we have taken away from our short term in operation. And then finally, some of the goals that we um, are striving to achieve in the coming years. Um, we will also be hosting a Q&A, a short Q&A at the end of the presentation. And if anyone um, has formed a collective of their own, um, please uh, do send the links in. Um, in the chat option below. So, um, yeah, let's start. So, POR, um, Poor Collective is an acronym for Power Out of Restriction. And POR um, focuses, as Katie said, focuses on the development of communities through the elevation of young people. Um, we see the importance of the younger generation, and we believe that the younger generation and the younger um, the youth are the future, so it is our responsibility. We, uh, we try to represent and provide a platform for young voices. Um, like through uh, knowledge sharing and design, um, we try to bridge the gap between communities, bringing together like, a wealth of demographics and uh, hopefully with the aim to inspire um, the, the, yeah, the youth. So we're a small team. Um, a team of four, um, and the first member of the team is um, Larry Botre. Um, Larry is head of communications here at Four Collective. Um, he's an architectural designer, researcher, and illustrator. Um, Larry has facilitated a number of um, youth workshops um, for various organizations, uh, most notably here at Four, and also helped facilitate a number of youth workshops whilst um, studying here as an, under, as an undergrad at Portsmouth University. Uh, Larry has a belief in the power of diverse voices in design, and this is something that resonates with me, as this was a, a dissertation topic of mine when I was studying here at the University of Portsmouth. The, we can move on. The second member is Ben. Um, ben is head of community engagement here at Paul. Ben is a speaker, um, architectural designer, and an environmental campaigner. He curates um, a number of workshops um, for organizations such as Four, and also another group that Ben is part of called 
ACAN, which stands for Architects Climate Action Network, and they aim to promote climate justice um, through Ben's work. He has now got, he, believe, uh, he believes in the power of youth-led activism. And this is something that he does, um, put, he pushes a lot with the work that we do at Paul. The third member is Sean, who is head of public relations um, here at Paul. Um, Sean is a writer, lecturer, and architectural designer. Um, he's really, really busy. <laughs> It's hard to get in contact with Sean uh, most of the time, but he's here today, which is good. Um, he currently teaches architecture at Central St. Martins. Um, Sean has also facilitated a number of uh, youth workshops for various organizations, including Paul, um, the University of Portsmouth, and also the City of London. And he is a big believer in the power of underrepresented voices, which is also something that we try to push here at Paul. And lastly um, is myself, Matt. Um, I'm head of operations here at Paul. I'm a part qualified accountant and a treasurer at um, Croydon Town, which is my football club. Um, I'm currently working alongside Mary with the Metropolitan Police. Um, we are trying to tackle issues involving policing in um, Southwest London. And we're working in collaboration with Paul um, to tackle these such issues because uh, I'm not sure if any of you know, but there are big um, disconnects and lack of trust between communities in London and police, just the met metropolitan police. Um, and move, yeah, so hopefully in the coming months, we'll have some positive news in, in relation to a potential collaboration. Um, I'm a big believer in financial literacy and I believe try to teach this to young the, the youth because this is something that we are not really taught growing up. So this is a, a huge passion of mine. And yeah, but it, it's, this is a small um, introduction as to who we are, and this feeds on nicely to how we came to be. So how we came to be. Um, next slide, please, um, Ben. So for, um, Paul formed quite organically. And it could be, a week, the um, steps could have been form, um, placed into maybe five uh, different groups. The first being our shared experience. Second, our shared values, then becoming a collective. But then our vision and mission, which really should have come much earlier. But then finally, we were able to develop Poor Collective as you know us today. So with our shared um, experience, we all come from working class backgrounds. And one thing we were able to benefit from growing up was youth clubs. In these youth clubs, we were able to um, have some support networks through mentors. But then these support networks were also um, even larger because we also had friendships that we developed through these, um, through these youth clubs. We also learned key skills, such as communication skills. But then also things like tea, um, things like um, cooking. Like I learned how to make a Victoria sponge cake, for example. So this leads us to our shared values. As you know, many of these youth clubs no longer exist. So we believe, and we believe that these facilities are key, are key um, spaces that you can benefit from, and, and youth can benefit from, and we did personally benefit from. So we thought that it's a huge loss that needed, um, and that it was a huge loss that needed to be, um, um, like uh, that, that needed to be um, refilled, uh, a huge hole that needed to be refilled, sorry. So we became a collective. We decided that we wanted to work together to provide this um, support system that had been um, lost with government cuts. And as you know, two heads are better than one. And we've proven that four heads are even better. So we decided to come together collectively to achieve our aims. But this is where we, met, um, um, where we moved towards our vision and mission. As I mentioned before, it's something that maybe we should have, um, should, which should have been our very first step because our vision and mission gave, uh, um, gave us an aligned um, outlook and an aligned, aligned aim, which didn't exist even though we had many shared values. But once we were able to achieve our vision and mission, we became poor collective as you know us today. So the shared 
vision. So as mentioned before, our vision, our, our, though we had similar values, our um, outlook wasn't entirely aligned. And the way we wanted to approach our, um, our practice wasn't entirely aligned. So we had to um, figure out what core exactly is, and that's what the vision is. It's the ambitious what. If, we, um, if you are um, successful beyond your wildest dreams, what is it exactly that you'll be able to achieve? And what would it look like? So after loads of discussion, like loads and loads of discussion and debate for weeks and weeks, we were able to come um, to form our vision, which is, uh, next slide please, Ben. A world where you see no limit. So that's our ultimate um, aim. So then we had to figure out how we were going to achieve these things. And that's when our mission comes up. So how do we achieve this ambitious what? Um, we decided to focus on the development of communities through the elevation of young people. Sorry, next slide, Ben. So, so we wanted to teach young people that they have the agency to make change. And we believe that, and that this is something that we believe we do through our own collective action. Now, this is a very, very important step that we recommend to absolutely anyone forming any form of um, any collective or any organization in general, because it allows you to develop your key values. And also it, gives, it, it also guides your decision making. If you get a commission, you, you're able to um, align it with your vision and mission and decide, well, does this, does this support what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve, or is it something that you should avoid because it goes against what you believe in? So this is, um, this is the stage, this is the stage we're at now. So what, what we do, um, we're going to go through a, a couple of our projects and I hope you, you enjoy them. Uh, I think they're some really exciting um, ways that we've taken some of the things that Larry earlier discussed, so taking our vision and our, our mission and creating something tangible out of that. Um, so, yeah. So the first project uh, I'd like to speak about is Carney's Mural. So essentially Carney's, uh, Carney's community is located in Southwest London, is a community center and a registered charity uh, that actually works with disadvantaged and excluded young people. Um, so a lot of these young people are, are um, in a way that the, the U Club is helping them um, kind of not uh, kind of move away from a life of crime or or um, things in the, in the streets or um, because a lot of them have uh, particular kind of issues or things happening in their lives and the the community center is, is a support is a support network but not only a support network it's a, it's a family so it's a place where the, these young people can come retreat to have uh, people that they can speak to mentors and of course keep fit and do exercise because Carney's community center is is a, a boxing a boxing gym but it, it does also house a, um, a series of, of small businesses so there is a, a, a organization called um, Easy Sundays that does a, a, a really good, um, really good macaroni and cheese and rice and beans. Um, but also they have a, a bike store. So as you can see in the, in the back, um, they've got a bike store. So what we actually did for, for this mural is working in collaboration with the Royal College of Art, Wandsworth Creative. So for those of you that aren't too familiar with um, uh, London, uh, Wandsworth is a, is a borough in in, in London. So working with ones of creatives and the young people, we designed a vibrant uh, a, a vibrant mural that showcased so, some of the things that are, are the most pertinent and important aspects of the local community for the young people. So as you can see in that picture on the right, um, we'll work with the young people to come up with designs. So think about what is it, what is integral, what is the most important thing to 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 them, and then working um, working out ways that we can visually showcase this so that we can create this um, mural uh, in, in a quite a quite a kind of run run down wall that needed some kind of vibrancy and life uh, brought back to it. Um, so here's a short clip of, of, of this process and some of the work that we, we did. Um, I'm not too sure if anyone can hear the, the sound, um, but essentially what, what we had done is 
that we had a series of workshops during the half term where we had spoken um, with the young people and asked them, what, what do you actually want to see in this exterior wall? So as you can see, there's an exterior wall at the front of the community center. So as people walk past it, they usually um, see it and comment and, 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 um, and uh, they, we, we've had quite a few kind of comments about, about how we kind of uh, brought life to, to this part of, of the city. Um, but certainly what, what you can see in this video is um, after these workshops, we worked with, after we finished coming up with the design with the young people, we, um, we, we painted it with them. So it wasn't only about designing something um, with them in mind, but it was also getting them involved in the process. So that they had a genuine stake in creating a, a piece of, of their community. And for us, that is something that's incredibly important. So in the video, you see um, Ben, Matt and, and Larry speaking about uh, the work that that we, we've done here, um, talking to the young people, um, and we, we've kind of got later Josh who, who speaks about the work that um, we, we did and how, how he like, enjoyed getting involved. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide if we, if we can't hear anything. So this is this is uh, one of the images. So this is one of the the young people that helped helped us with the mural. Um, so yeah, for us it's important when we're when we're doing the work and when we're saying that we want to help communities and we and we um, really want to give young people a stake is is that is not just something that we're saying is is the crux of what we do. So throughout our our work, we always go back to that vision and mission. Like, how do we engage young people? How can we give them skills? How can we um, really give them a stake in, in, in what is happening around them? Um, so as you can see here, these are some images. If we go to the next image, these are some images of the mural and you can see the young people are um, getting involved. So, uh, I mean, uh, I, I know for, for many of you, but like, as designers, you wanna have full control, but I think what is what is really important here, what was amazing is giving a lot of the kind of control and trust to the young people and showing them that we, we, we believe you can you can really do it. We're not just saying you could do it, like we, we, we're giving you the paintbrush as you as you can see. And then yeah, that's a, a, another picture. I mean the, the mural is not quite finished yet. It's still, it's still, we're still um working on it. So we don't have a picture of of, of the final one, but um make sure to, to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and you, you'll soon see the final, the final mural in the in the coming weeks. Um so another project that we've been working on um is the people pavilion. So we, we speak about collaboration, co-working in, in terms of work with the young people, co-design. Um, and this is something that really showcases that because the Peel Pavilion essentially is a design competition for young people aged between 14 to 19 years old. So in collaboration with the Royal Institute of British Architects, Beyond the Box Consultants, Here East and Here East, we actually worked to, um, to launch um, this pavilion uh, competition. But what is amazing about the People Pavilion is that it's not only a pavilion, it has a, a, a kind of a cauldron of different activities, opportunities and um, initiatives going on. So one of the first things that actually happened within within this was um, that we, we employed young people. So as part of the People Pavilion, the, 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 um, the group of us, so essentially the People Pavilion is, is um, architects, designers, curators, um, engineers, like there's a wealth of different organizations that have come together for this. But for this, we wanted young people involved. So we're, we're doing a competition for young people. So it was important that we, we employed young people to hear what they wanted to say, because I think too often these competitions or these things are kind of uh, suggest or they, they guess what young people want, but don't actually give them a real stake. So um, there was a series of uh, roles for, for hosts that would go out and, and record and, and um, go out in the field and speak to young people and ask them what they would like to see in um, East London, because the pavilion it will be built in um, East London. So I don't know how many of you know um, the, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Park, um, so it, it will be built there. So as I said, mentioned before, it's not only a design competition for a pavilion, there was also a poetry competition. So there were several um, 
poems. So the, the, the premise of the competition was to, to ask young Londoners, what does it mean to take up space in London? So there were several amazing entries that articulated their um, young people experience as a young Londoner, but also what it feels like to take up space or um, especially it, with, with all the things that um, young people are currently facing uh, across, across this part of, of the UK. So after, after a long kind of battle of us going through the poems and seeing um, who we think is the um, best. So uh, when I speak, uh, okay, I want you can hear the sound perfect. And that doesn't mean passive listening to lost words or appeasement without real concern. No, I want the attention that my voice deserves. My emotions matter. Uncharacterized by your perception of the angry black girl, when in truth, you never aimed to understand how I felt. So afraid to be the one who makes it all about race that I stop speaking out on the problems I face, but I'm learning, I'm worthy of taking up space. Representation matters. Because who said different equated to wrong? When diversity is what makes society strong, why do I feel like I don't belong? When I'm part of a team and no one else looks like me. And please, Leave your ignorance at the door because inequality is no longer something to be ignored, even if it has become society's norm. My presence matters because it's important to be seen, to show other black girls that their goals are within reach, to dream of the future I want to build without a glass ceiling that is already sealed, to not only work but excel in my field. Now I'm still learning to find my place, to be patient, work hard, and run my own race. But my presence, they can never erase when I believe I'm worthy of taking up space. So yeah, as Aretha beautifully articulated, um, that was how she felt um, taking up space in London. So, what was what was actually fantastic about that that poem was that we after after um, the entries, the winner was at, was actually given the opportunity to film um, the poem. So, Arifa, the aim is that Arifa will perform that poem once the pavilion actually opens. So, hopefully, some of you will be able to to pop down and, and see that. Um, and these are two other videos that we actually filmed. So as part of the Peel Pavilion, uh, there was a series of um, like digital workshops that we that we uh, created. I, I think something else to mention is that a lot of the work that we've been doing has been during uh, the pandemic. So um, it's fantastic to see that whilst whilst there's so much restrictions, there's still opportunity. There's still opportunities to work, opportunity to do some um, fantastic work. Um, so as you can see on, on the left, that's Larry speaking, uh, Larry and Ben speaking about how to draw a plan, a section and an elevation and teaching kind of uh, basic architectural principles, but also design principles because um, it, these are things, skills that graphic designers uh, also and, and other kind of designers use. And, and, and then two, to the right, you can see um, uh, Darcy, Dar Darcy speaking about acting. So given an actor trainer uh, uh, workshop. Oh, can you hear any sound? Uh, so um, this, this, uh, so as, as I said earlier, there was, um, we, we got a, a series of co-hosts to actually speak about, speak to young Londoners and ask them what if, uh, how, like several questions about being a young Londoner. Um, so as you can see here, these co-hosts are speaking to, to um, several young people and they had a round, uh, round table discussion discussing what it, what it means to be a Londoner, what's happening in London. And, and, and what was interesting is um, at the time, 
uh, for, for those of you that probably don't know, travel for young Londoners is free, but um, at the time there was, uh, like, it was uncertain whether this was going to be taken away. So these were discussions, giving young people a platform to discuss these things that are happening in, in, in their area. All right, cool. Um, so this is the last kind of bit of the presentation. Hope you're all still hanging in there. Um, but this is a bit that we kind of added on uh, for you guys, really. That's a bit more of a kind of introspective look about, of what kind of poor is and what we're trying to do. We've been going for about a year now and we've uh, encountered quite a few kind of like uh, roadblocks along the way, kind of difficulties as we've tried to do things. And I'd say like approach kind of uh, our aims in quite a kind of new and different way considering that three of our members have design backgrounds, but we are a social enterprise and a, 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 essentially a youth, um, youth engagement collective. That's what we really are. Uh, but along the way, we've kind of um, had to uh, work with a lot of people to help us establish our kind of methodology. And we see ourselves really now, this is something actually we were speaking about very recently about what we realised was a kind of quite unconscious decision to be very nomadic. I think it was Sean was saying we were having a chat on Sunday and he's saying like, well, hang on, wait a minute. Why didn't we just, if we we're a youth, youth uh, engagement team, why don't we just have a youth club? <laughs> why didn't we just set one of those up and just do that? And I was like, well, hang on, why, why are we so interested in like working with all these different people, collaborating with other people? And I think I, the reason what I kind of saw it as was because we're very interested in kind of testing our methodology in different kind of contexts and going to different places that, or, or pre-existing platforms, pre-existing spaces and testing our kind of way of doing things or what we think we want to do in those contexts. And I think that's been like incredibly rewarding. So, the, so right here is just some of the people that we've already kind of like collaborated with in the last year. And there, there's, uh, there's the RIBA, RIBA there. But apart from that, there's not really many other kind of like architectural e kind of um, people. Some 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 groups that like hang around on the fringe of design and architecture, and as as we kind of do, I suppose. Um, but there's also we're also actively trying to get out and talk to other people in other fields and try our methodology there. So, for example, um, kindness communities have already said Fourth Monkey, which is the actor training company that we're very friendly with, and then Delgano Trust, which is a as, as a, a charity based in uh, West London that we're hopefully fingers crossed going to be doing some stuff with soon so that's a kind of a, a kind of a, a statement from us about you know where we are and what we're trying to do and who we who we want to kind of like uh test our methodology against if that makes sense um but along that way we've had to like kind of really think about what that means and as kind of larry's kind of already articulated uh we found that um having a very 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 clear uh, mission and a very clear vision of what you want to do was absolutely key for us. I mean, in a way, the pandemic was quite helpful, especially in the first lockdown, because we were literally forced to sit down and, like Larry said, argue for weeks. I'm not even joking, like literally weeks about what we exactly what we want to do. And we were able to get, I, I feel, some very, very clear statements of what it is we do quite, quite early on. Uh, and it, the sooner, as soon as we managed to do that, uh, that it just sort of snapped into place. And it couldn't have come sooner because what we did also find is that because uh, Poor Collective has a lot of inbuilt social value just from who we are, what we want to do and what we're trying to do, some, some big, big names were very keen to like immediately come along and start working with us. And we always had to go through this process of... of um, learning that we had to define ourselves to stop other people defining us for, for themselves and putting you in a little box, which could have very easily happened to us. There was a kind of couple of moments where if we hadn't really kind of like pushed back at certain moments, I think we would or would have become something quite different and something that I wouldn't be as happy with. So that was like, in, in terms of this, you know, being a professional practice kind of thing. I think that was absolutely key. Like that kind of just learning that you need to really, really define yourself very quickly in, in political terms, in social terms, in a professional sense as well, in all those aspects, especially when you work in a non-hierarchical way, which is what Paul does. We work in a very non-hierarchical way. 
which longs out every process that you wouldn't believe, but also just the quality control I feel is, is unbelievable in, in the work we do. Um, so those are kind of like, yeah, I think those, those are kind of lessons that we've had to learn. And like one of the ones now I'm just looking at now, which I don't think we have learned to do just yet as well as I would like is effectively managing our time. <laughs> I think we, <laughs> we have a little bit of work to do on that one, lads. But um, anyway, uh, so, that's, so that's like kind of some lessons that we've kind of learned. And I think if there's one thing you kind of like take away from this, I think it's that is uh, it's learning to like be very, very, very clear and, uh, and definite about what you're trying to achieve in, in, your, in your kind of um, social and professional capacity. Uh, do that sooner rather than later. So if you've got a little idea now, but like, oh, I don't know, I really want to go into like, I don't know, virtual reality design or whatever. Like, but what are you trying to do within that? Because we knew we wanted to go into youth work, but, but then that, it's not enough. Like, you know, you need to go further than that. Because um, otherwise people will do that job for you. So that's our kind of like lessons uh, learned. Uh, and then finally, our kind of our goals, really, and what we're trying to do, because we are in the process, I feel, of trying to, um, one, we're trying to break out of the uh, design industry. I think we're, we're consciously trying to do that at the moment, or rather not be so heavily involved in it and look at other interesting industries where we can take, you know, some of our members have uh, really like quite advanced design skills now. Where else can we take them? What other context can we bring them into? And how can that be interesting? So can we work, you know, in the film industry or can we work in the fashion industry? I know that's something that um, Larry's quite interested in, just for example, or, or take it into the finance industry as well through Matt. But it doesn't even have to be through that. Maybe we start exploring astrophysics. We've got one contact who's a, who's a, who's a physicist and we'd like, we, we've already said we'd kind of like to work with her. So that's kind of what we'd like to do from that. And we're... And I think this maybe this frames like the kind of the upcoming like Q&A or, or rather what I prefer it to be, which is just a discussion about how you can go about that. Because we have um, struggled to like, you know, break out of that industry. It's, it's, it's something we thought we could just leave. But actually, it's, it's quite hard to leave the industry you've literally spent the last 10 years in. Right. And it kind of drags you back a bit, which, which, which is, I think is quite interesting how the industry you try to leave the industry. The industry doesn't want you to leave. Um, so that's so those, that's one of our kind of I'd say that's like our main goal as we expand the poor kind of network and our kind of and our, and our collective as well. I think we're looking to expand into as many kind of different areas as we can and, and kind of explore what kind of youth engagement means within all these different contexts. Because um, I think that's the main thing that helps us get through a lot of these things is, is remembering that it is about young people, it is about the youth. That's the main thing we're focusing on. Um, so expanding our our collective expanding our mentoring framework and of course our main goal as well is looking for more money so <laughs> if we can find money uh, that would be that, that's good for us as well this year but that's a kind of like statement of intent of where we kind of want to be going and hopefully that can kind of um i think i'll, I'll, I'll stop blathering on now but uh, that that's kind of like where we're at now and, and i think that's where we're kind of like trying to where we're trying to get to in the next year is like trying to start exploring those spaces and those contexts so yeah unless um unless i've missed anything i think maybe uh, if anyone's if any of the boys want to pick me up on anything i've missed no is that all right yeah no yeah good <laughs> um maybe we can try and like open it out to um a little bit of q a if anyone like violently disagrees with something we've said uh maybe you can like you know uh, voice it now I don't know if it, is there a protocol for like a do you, do you have to type into the chat or can you just no no out? not at all people can yeah. turn their microphones on but um if you want. I've got a question to get the ball rolling um, or a discussion point as you say so um when you're working across these different fields I guess of activity and of interest um how do you uh go about making connections that are genuine you know if you're outside of your expertise if you like how do you go about meeting those people and deciding whether that's a genuine interest to pursue? Is that something you guys discuss when you approach new projects? That's a really good question, I think, because it's actually really tricky to like meet with someone and understand what, not what their agenda is, but like understand what they want out of you and what we want out of them. And I think that we often talk to someone just out of this, because of what situation we're in now where everything has to be over Zoom and stuff. 
our necessity. All our meetings have to be quite long and quite frequent as well. So we often talk to a, another collaborator for quite a long time before we do anything with them. And that's not exact. I wouldn't say that's like a conscious decision, but it is something we do. We usually have a, quite a long conversation with someone before we actually do anything. And I think that helps to kind of like um, filter out uh, people that um, just don't really align with our uh, values, I guess you'd say. And, and yeah. also, just to add to that as well, mm. and this was the point that we mentioned earlier about coming, formulating a vision and mission, what we found to begin with was that there were like, plenty of organisations coming to us and they were coming to us with something that they had in mind and wasn't really considering us. And then that was, it was at that point where we needed to take a step back and kind of figure out what it is that we want to do because we don't just want to be um, a, a tick in a box for a lot of these organisations. We want to, to, to formulate a, a really good working relationship. So, um, yeah, that was something that we really needed to, to focus on at, at the start. Mm. I'd add one extra thing to that, and that's just 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 about the, the young people themselves as well. One thing we've learned about um, sort of collaborating is that there's an opportunities to like once we've made those connections, we can actually make these formal connections with some of the young people as well. So the more people we begin to work with, learn from, and so on, gives um, it basically gives a greater opportunity for those young people as well. So I think that's part of the reason why we want to expand as well. Mm and diversify mm. so it's a very organic growth of a kind of network i suppose of people i think so yeah, yeah. i think mm. so mm. so i just um there's a question in the chat box about why you mentioned wanting to get out of the design industry yeah can I, can um, I, take, can I take this one yeah go. I, think, I feel like they're there because <laughs> yeah, i made this big statement <laughs> We're done with the um yeah it's um i don't think it's that we want to get out i think it's just that um uh Maybe I should have like not said the design industry and more specifically actually just say what I really mean, which is the architectural industry, um, because there's more. I, th I don't think you can get away from the fact that the three of us are designers. That's just implicit in the team. But we don't want to get out. We just want to expand. So there's certain things you can do within architecture for youth work. There's some certain things you can't do. There's not the architecture industry is incredibly uh, problematic if you're from a working class background. That is an issue, but one that we are, and one they're interested in talking about. But I think we can be more effective. I think we just don't want to limit ourselves. We just don't want to limit ourselves to just doing that. I think there's so many other places we can be incredibly effective. So although, you know, three of us are architectural designers, yeah. But I think that doesn't mean we just have to do architecture. Not that I'm saying you're saying that, obviously. But yeah, I think we just, we just, we don't want to limit ourselves too much. And also in terms of the process, right? Like, it's so interesting to, for example, what does it mean for a, an architect, architectural designer to create, a, um, create some kind of um, tangible design with a, I don't know, like a lighting, I don't know, like a sound physicist or something, I'm not sure. The thing is, there's so many possibilities when you begin to, like, um, like cross-pollinate, you know, and, like, really think about different ways of approaching design. You know, I think generally achieving the same goal but with different disciplines, with different ways of thinking, it's just like a more exciting way to approach things, you know, because suddenly you're able to really diversify your approach and maybe create something really incredible. Yeah. Uh, to, to, add, to add to that and kind of contextualise this a little bit, we're not saying that the architecture industry is void and like <laughs> we're trying to jump out of the industry, but as each of you will, will, will know that... Um, when you're studying architecture, you're learning a wealth of different skills. So you're not only learning how to really become an architect, you're learning how to be a designer, how to um, be someone that kind of can, can uh, like a speaker, like someone that can articulate the ideas. Um, you're, you're becoming more organized. Like there's such a rich kind of skill set that architects um, work to, to like develop in architecture school. And we believe that there's, there's endless amounts of possibilities and directions that you can take those skills. So you don't necessarily have to say you want to be an architect with a capital A and design like the next, um, the next Pantheon or design the next um, kind of uh, 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 BB Doshi-esque um, modernist building. Like we're saying that there's opportunities for you to take your skills and, and design something as simple as a mural or design a piece of, of furniture or design something in the public realm. 
Um, and I think that there's so many skills. So in a way, don't limit yourself. Uh, don't, don't limit yourself to say, I've got to design buildings. Uh, like you could design whatever you want. And I think that's something that's really important to us because we might decide we want to design a building with young people at some point, but we might also decide that we simply just want to design a chair. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, think, I think it's keeping your options open and not, not uh, kind of pigeonholing yourself and saying, you know what, I'm going to go in this particular route because I think it's, it's a learning process um, and you, you, you kind of go through the process to, to learn and, and see what you actually want to design in the future. Mm. I think oren has got a question. Oren? Yeah, no, th thank you. First of all, thank you very much for, for your presentation. It's great to have you guys here and having that voice in the school is, is, is great. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm reacting a little bit to the, this kind of thing about, you know, architecture is this way and it's problematic, which is absolutely true. And it'd be great to have that discussion as well, particularly from a professional practice point of view and, and the problems which seem to be uh, some in, in somehow inherent in, in the profession, which is um, worthy of discussion and pushing, keep pushing at that one. So. In a way, I see your work um, from my perspective, but I would say this as not making the choice not to do something, but actually expanding potentially what one might think architecture is. So, you know, th but that would be me saying that because I just think, you know, I, I studied architecture in the end at a master's level because I thought architecture was everything that I wanted to do anyway. It was philosophy and culture and this and that and design and economics and the whole gamut is covered yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, but I think that what you guys are involved with is, is, is a kind of um, questioning and inherently critiquing some of what is known to be that architectural profession yeah. by also saying that you're doing architecture in a way. Yeah. You know, so, so I just find that um, as an opportunity maybe uh, to look at your work through that lens um, huh. and then really wanting to have at some point, maybe it'd be good to have you back to have that discussion around what, how you find it um, problematic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you might end up regretting that because you'll get like a five hour <laughs> of me shouting. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think architecture is everything, but it doesn't mean that other stuff isn't everything as well. So it's, I think it's just that um, there's just so much other stuff out there for Absolutely. us. And I think that, Absolutely. yeah, I think that, um, and I think that, it's never, it's, and you know, all of us, you say about the kind of, they, I feel, feel like there is just, this might be me being completely out of touch, but I really think there is like a kind of sea change coming in architecture as well. Like the whole, like, I'm sure you've all seen like, you know, the latest survey and stuff in the AP, student survey and stuff and the way that people have reacted to that. And I think, yeah, it's so like interesting to see that happen. And I think that the more architecture can be contextualized within other design industries and just other industries in general, the more we can do to like pop the kind of weird bubble of like certain things that are just considered acceptable in architecture and really shouldn't. And the more we can kind of like link it to other industries where they've already kind of sorted a lot of the problems out there. Yeah. The better because we can like, it just contextualizes everything, context is everything, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can contextualize the architectural industry against other ones, the better. Does anyone, I don't know, what do, what do the other boys think? <laughs> I kind of, <laughs> yeah, thanks, sorry. <laughs> I think you did a good job, Ben. I think it to is. add to that, I think what would be great for the students to look at is, is other kind of collectives or other organizations, because um, we're in such a uh, unprecedented time with the pandemic, but you can already go back. If you kind of go in the time machine and look at the time of, of the, the recession, many architects couldn't actually find work or they were being made redundant. So uh, as a result of that, a lot of designers actually started creating small collectives or small organizations where they were trying to get work, but wasn't necessarily directly related to the work that, that they had kind of envisioned. So there's many organizations that started out from this. So if you look at Resolve Collective, if you look at the work of like Assemble, um, a, there's a wealth of, of organizations that came out and, and are doing work that's kind of on the periphery of architecture or on the periphery of design. Um, so in a way, we're not the kind of like the, the, the only ones that are doing uh, things like this, but, but we are, have just honed in on the youth aspect. So there's, there's various different examples where you can see that the team has, has loads of different disciplines and work very collaboratively. Um, and I think we're seeing this in the pandemic because again, 
the uncertainty with jobs, um, job security, uh, or like what's happening, a lot of people are going to start up their own organization. So I think it's worth even thinking about if you've got similar interests to anyone um, in, in, in your year or other people, other courses, I think it's worth having those conversations and being like, well, what do you think? Like, should we just go for this? Like, and we're seeing this kind of resurgence of a lot of young designers doing this. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to start thinking, can I be an architect, but also do fashion? Or can I be an architect, but I also do um, like, I don't know, I, I do stuff in finance. And I think the, like, there's so much opportunity. So again, kind of going back to what I said, like, like you could do anything with your your degree, so so don't just think I'm going to be sitting in an office and designing stairs. Like no, you you, you won't be. You'll be doing uh, you'll be doing whatever you want to be doing. There's a great um, there's sorry there's a no, great no, no. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the um, the line from Cedric Price, but then you're not. But Cedric Price, who you may know, a very famous architect um, out of the well through and around, but not exactly archigram days, but. Um, he once said that sometimes uh, the best answer to give as an architect to um, a couple who actually shouldn't be together is, no, you shouldn't build a house right now. You should just get a divorce. Get a divorce yeah. And, you know, <laughs> but, but essentially just underlying that understanding that sometimes it's not the building. The building might not be the answer, hmm. you know, and um, that doesn't mean that the architect or the interior architect's training hasn't allowed them to be open enough to understand that, you know, no, that's not the answer. Mm. A spatial design is not the answer. It's something mm. else. Mm. So anyway, I just wanted to. No, no, I think it's really good. I think, I think Larry knows this better than me, but is it, I can't remember if it's architecture zero zero or, or gray metal. I'd love to have the one about the, you know what I'm talking about? The one about the fire escape thing or the, what's that one? It's like, basically they were asked to like, uh, design, I think it's architecture zero zero were asked to, um, design a new kind of corridor for a school to help ease congestion when all the, the bell went off and all the students went out but they ended up saying no you don't need a new corridor you need a new system of how your bell works so they fa they designed a system of how phasing the kind of alarm that would tell students that their their uh classes were over that phased it throughout the building and ease congestion that way so rather than just like just like widening the corridors right they did they, they did a system solution instead of a physical one which is like Super cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the... There Great, more, you've put lots of links in the chat box to other yes. assemblers, one we've looked at um, uh, before as well. But I just wonder, a lot of these are contemporaries of yours. Are there people in history or are there mentors that you guys look to collectively? Yeah. For example, that have, you know, in the past or, you know, where does your inspiration come from in that sense? One, one is cooking sessions for sure. They're not like super historic, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but but they but they were our tutors at um, or or um, well, one, some of our tutors at the um, RCA, and but generally the thing that's interested in simply their approach, like they're they're looking at architecture and food, and ultimately that results in climate. Like, how do you think about the climate? How can you approach it? And it's just so interesting because they really exam exemplify how you can apply this sort of spatial knowledge and research mm. and develop a, um, what's it called, and develop real life solutions, you know? So it's def definitely, definitely worth um, looking into. And one of my colleagues has asked a question about, um, to invite, how do we, um, tips on how to invite people to be this brave, but maybe it's about confidence. And <laughs> you guys all seem pretty, like pretty confident guys. So what would you Fate say to someone? <laughs> There might be um, students uh, watching this who maybe don't feel like they have that sort of embodied confidence. Yeah. What is it that made it apparent to you that as a mission that you needed to achieve and sort of feel confident about doing? I think like, it's confidence. Even. Yeah, I don't know. I think we're just nice like to... very... Sorry, sorry, Larry, go on. Oh, no, it's just uh, like we've come together to, like, like, to do something that maybe we wouldn't be able to do alone, you know? So we've recognised that there's something that we want to and work towards. There's a, a series of issues we would, would like to solve, or at least like take um, to, like um, attempt to solve. And we've done it collectively because, like my terrible joke before, two heads are better than one and four. <laughs> and so no, it's a good joke. But, <laughs> but you know, but, but, but you know what I mean, right? It's like recognising that yes, there's an issue. Yes, yeah. we all have agency to make change. So let's make it. And mm. even better if you do it collectively, because then you have you um you can merge your skills, merge your mm. networks, 
magic interest and so on and so forth yeah. and and sort of spear spear forward spearhead i think i think and i think we really like back each other up as well like it's exactly. like easy when you've got like three guys behind you for all, all women who right. like kind of like so for example like uh literally in the middle of this um talk larry said a phrase that i'd not heard him use before when we talked about him, said, he said the ambitious what right and i thought oh that's a beautiful way of phrasing it i literally whatsapp and saying great phrase well done right so like you just back each other up like that's all you've got to do like if you've got a team behind you you've got like friends and colleagues who back you up like it's always going to be helpful and doing something flexibly is always going to be and and yeah. and also can i add to this yeah, as on. well um it's yeah stepping out of your comfort zone um like being it so if you're passionate about something you do step out of your comfort zone there's so many times where me sean larry and ben will jump on a, a meeting with someone from the architectural space and I have no um, knowledge in, in architecture. I have a smidge amount through living with Sean and everyone else at university and hearing them talk about you know, like architecture a lot. So I have a small amount of knowledge, but it still can be overwhelming. And, and so I could easily just shy away from it and just not turn up. But I I'd, I'd make the conscious effort to turn up to learn and just yeah, just know within myself that if I, if I don't do this, I'm not gonna, gonna uh, learn anything. So. Yeah, it's just like stepping up the comfort zone, understanding that you are stepping up the comfort zone. And there are many people like myself or like you who are feeling um, nervous or feeling shy about something. And just embracing it, really. I think to add to that is about, for us, it might come across as, as confidence, but I think it's, it's passion. It's, these are things that are, are, are re we're really passionate about, like honestly and genuinely passionate about. These are discussions that we've had way before um, Poor Collective, like way before getting like getting our architecture degree, these are things that are kind of integral to us. So um, when we're talking about young people and helping young people, we're given a, a bit of ourselves and we're kind of revealing ourselves to everyone. So it's not that we're kind of putting on this act and we're coming here and then trying to be super confident. We're talking about something that we really genuinely care about. And when when you're doing something that you you care about and you're kind of working towards something that you you, you like. That is important to you that's where the confidence comes from because you know that this is something i want the world to see or this is the help that i want to give other people and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be the, the best public speaker or you're going to be the most articulate but it means that you can still make a difference in in whatever you're doing because you don't need to be the person that's at the forefront of an organization to make that difference but the fact that you're making those steps like it's fantastic because if you were to speak to those young people what is so rewarding about some of the work that we do is just seeing how, how, how much we impact them. Um, and we're not going up to, to, to kind of like make sure that, oh yeah, that like everyone could be like, oh, poor collective. We're, we're, we're generally going out to help people. And then from that, you kind of like, wow, I've done this, you know, I'm gonna do another project and then I'm gonna do another project. And then slowly you kind of kind of build up the strength to, to speak about these stuff. But I think you're never gonna you're never gonna just keep one day wake up and be like you know what, I'm confident now. <laughs> so like, I think it's something that's an ongoing process. And and if we tie it back into architecture, a lot of the stuff that we're doing is is what you do in architecture school. Like we're presenting our work. It's the same as a crit. I mean, we're quite lucky that we aren't getting critiqued, but it's the same. <laughs> it's the same principle. So. Um, what we've done mostly is just taken a lot of the stuff that we learned from architecture school um, or uh, well, in the case of, of Matt, just in general, like life skills and just translated them into something. And I think everyone could do that. Well, I think that's probably a, a good place to end things. Thanks very much, guys. It's been really that's great nice. having you here and welcoming that's you back to the school, albeit virtually, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully one day in person. Um, Thanks so much. I, I, everyone can switch off their microphones and do a round of applause. That would be fantastic. And um, yeah, we'll keep going. Hey. <laughs> a delay over the internet. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Nice. Thank, you so much fun. thank you for having us. Thank you so much.